Sitaram je Sitaram Sitaram je Sitaram 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 Sitaram, 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 Sitaram. Sitaram je Sitaram 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 je Sitaram Sitaram, 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 je Sitaram. Sitaram, Sitaram. Sitaram je Sitaram 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 je Sitaram Sitaram, 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 Jeje, Sitaram, Sitaram. Sitaram, 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 Sitaram. Sitaram Jeje, Sitaram, Sitaram. Sitaram, Sitaram, Sitaram Jeje, Sitaram, Sitaram. Sitaram, 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 je Sitaram.
But we have to recognize that we're asleep and we're dreaming. We think this is real, just like we do at night when we're sleeping. We think our dreams, we experience our dreams as real while we're in them, don't we? Most of us do. This is also a dream. And there are beings who are actually awake in this dream. And those beings give us certain hints and clues and uh, teachings to wake us up. And Maharaji gave very simple but very powerful teachings. And the main thing that he said, aside from loving everyone and serving everyone, which is, we'll get to that, was Ram Nam Karne Se Sapura Ho Jatahe. From going on repeating these names of God, everything is accomplished. Hello? From going on repeating these names, everything is accomplished. Everything is made full and complete. All the karmas are ripened. What we need comes to us. What we don't need leaves us. All through the repetition of the name. This is what we do in our dream to wake ourselves up. And when we wake up, we have everything we've always longed for in the dream. It's been uh, 49 years since he left the body. Is that right? Something like that. It's a ripening process. It's a ripening process. It's not about learning. It's not about imagining. It's not about pretending. It's not about manipulating our emotions to feel any particular thing. It's about doing some practice. It's only from practice, which we do by grace, but we'll get to that. It's only from practice that we're going to wake up. Otherwise, we're just going to keep schlogging around in this shit forever. Almost forever. Nothing's forever. So, the repetition of the name. Am I okay, Kev? Okay. I got strict instructions. Stay close to the microphone. Okay. So, but can you just sit down and go Ram Ram for the rest of your life? No, neither can I. We want stuff. We're busy. We've got all kinds of things to do. You know, the fourth season of Westworld just finished. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to binge the whole thing. But I'm going to go back and binge from the beginning because I can't remember a fucking thing. I have to go back and binge. We're busy. We're busy. But when we do remember, when that thought comes, like, maybe I should do a little meditation or a little practice, do it. But please, don't try too hard. That's just more neurosis. Do a little bit of practice and give yourself fully to those moments. And then do a little more. You sit down and try, I'm going to sit here for two hours. All you're going to do is think and dream for two hours, you know, come on. Maybe if you get a couple of rounds in, you'll be lucky. So you have to kind of, we have to kind of deal with where we're really at, not where we'd like to think we're at. And it's very humbling. Because, come on, you know. Don't you hate everybody? <laughs> Tell the truth, God damn it. We don't love everybody, we fucking hate everybody. Get the fuck out of my way. I'm, you know, yeah. 
That's my orange juice in the frozen can there. Get away from it, you know. We really, we're cranky bastards. We really have to get into it, understand. We have to see where we're at. If we don't see what's really in there, we'll never be able to let go of it. So there's no sense pretending. Who are you fooling? Who are we fooling? Ourselves? Yeah. And if we're fooling ourselves, it's not very useful. But that's okay. He knows. They know who we are. And they love us just as we are. We don't love us just as we are, but they do because they see who we really are, which is, you know what? So let's, you got to start, we have to start where we are. And that's very difficult because we like to think we're really great. You know, I remember one time I'm driving down the parkway to the city, <clears throat> the, the public radio station wanted some of the CDs, so I was driving them down. I was going down to the city anyway. And I'm driving along, and uh, there's, there's my CDs on the, the passenger seat, and I said, why don't I listen to one? Everybody else listens to me in their car. I might as well listen to me. <laughs> so I put me in, and I'm driving along, Hare Krishna! This is great, yeah. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna! And then, Somebody cuts me off. Son of a bitch! <laughs> I'm sorry, who the, who was that? So I, and I, and I look down. It's this little old lady, big thick glasses, trying to see over the steering wheel like, like this. I, don't know. I was ready to kill, you know. She didn't see me at all, and that was the problem. I, but she wasn't aiming at me, or I took it personally. Somebody cut me off, right? Nobody cut me off. She just changed lanes. I happened to be there. <laughs> so, yeah. If we keep on reacting and bouncing off stuff all day, all life long, we just keep creating more suffering for ourselves and the people in our lives. So, some, some practice is necessary. Think of it like sinking an anchor. You know, the waves come, the storms come. If you've got a good anchor, the boat's not going to get blown around too much. No anchor, you're finished. So, practice is like sinking that anchor down. But it's it's done in a very simple, natural way. You, you simply sing, and then you go and do your life. You do your practice, then you, then you go live. You don't, you don't have to be, think of yourself as a great yogi, or a great this, or a great that. It's not necessary to think about yourself at all, actually, except for the basics. When I was having a nervous breakdown and hallucinating, complete flip out in the temple, Maharaji called me and uh, he said, what are you going to do, jump in the river? You can't, you can't die. He said, worldly people don't die. Only Jesus died the real death. What? Why? Because he never thought of himself. Thoughts of me, 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 how am I now, how am I now, how do I relate to this? Those didn't arise in that being. There was no ego in that being. But what do we do all day long? What do we do all day long? We think about ourselves. What am I got? What do I have? What, do I, what don't I have? What do they have that I want? And it's, how am I now? Am I tall enough, short enough, fat enough, big enough, blonde enough, black enough? Who knows what I am? All we do is think about ourselves. And you can't stop. You think you can stop? Okay, I'm not going to think. What was I thinking? You can't stop the thoughts. Thoughts are going to keep coming. They're like waves coming 
in off the ocean in storms that happened weeks ago. And the thoughts that we have now are waves that are coming from karmas that we created lifetimes ago. The only option we have is to recognize and let go. You can't, where's the thought? You're going to shoot it while it goes by? All you can do is let go. But even that is not easy. Well, first, we have to get a, a deeper uh, sense of uh, gravity. We have to be able to sit more comfortably in ourselves. But because we hate ourselves, we don't want to sit comfortably in ourselves. We want somebody else to make us feel good. It doesn't work. <laughs> I remember Dada was one of Maharaji's great devotees. And uh, for Dada, there was only Maharaji. He was married and a large family. He didn't have children, but they had a large family. And one time, one of the Westerners came to his house, and he and his girlfriend had broken up. And the guy is crying in Dada's lap, saying, oh, Dada, I can't live without her. I can't live without her. And Dada's telling me this story. And then he looks at me and said, can you imagine that? For Dada, you know, what is the relationship? He's just like, he couldn't understand. Westerners, oh boy. But you see, Maharaji knew all that. He, and he loves us exactly as we are. That's really difficult. Hard to accept. It's hard to feel also. We don't let ourselves feel those kind of things. We're so busy. I feel bad about saying this, but personally for me, the pandemic was fantastic. I was happy as a pig in shit. <laughs> Sitting on the couch in the living room, no bags to pack, no plane reservations to make, nothing to do except sit there. Wow. And finally, over like months and months and months, I finally settled a little bit. What an incredible feeling not to be busy trying to find something, get something, be something. It was amazing. But our lives don't really allow for a lot of time like that. And that's a shame because we need that time. We need to find some space where we can just chill. And when you're hungry, you look for food. So the more we notice and begin to understand what we need, then we'll look for that space. We'll find that space in our lives. So please, keep your eyes open and try to find some space to just relax. Just sit for a few minutes. Don't do any practice like, you know, just sit. You're allowed. You're allowed to just sit around and do shit. Nothing. Try it. It's scary. It's not easy. You want, oh, God, I got that. I'll watch my breath. No, no, no. Just sit. No, no, no. I'll count my breath. I'll do mantra. I'll do mantra. I'll do mantra. No, just sit. It's not easy. But we just, it's like we, there's a tack on our emotional butt. And every time we try to sit down, boop, we get up. <laughs> it's not easy just to relax and take it easy. We're used to beating ourselves up. We're used to needing this and that and wanting this and that and being hungry for so many things. And it's OK. I mean, it's just we're never going to be happy that way because happiness Joy, this feeling of okayness is actually in there already. And 
all these practices, no matter what they are, are designed to uncover that place within each one of us that's already here. If it wasn't here, we wouldn't be here. So even when you do practice, try to do it in a, a relaxed way. Don't be uh, ambitious with your practice. It's not going to help. There's nowhere to go. It's not like you're going to get somewhere. You're going to finally recognize that you're already here. But not here. That doesn't help. In here, you'll feel it. It's very different than just kind of understanding. Yeah, we're all here, right? Yeah. No. One has to really feel it. And it's very possible. Because, for instance, with these names that we chant, these are the names of that place. These are the names of that place within each one of us, because it's the same place. The soul is the same. The essence is the same in each one of us, which is what the, the all one means when Maharaji says all one. That's the indwelling presence in each one is exactly the same. That's what's looking out of all of our eyes right now. And these eyes are like, pasting on to this meat puppet. But what's looking through the eyes is the same for each one of us. That's consciousness, pure being. So, and that's what these names are the names of that place within us. So through the invocation and the repetition of these names, Little by little, gradually, but inevitably, which is a very good word, inevitably that place is uncovered. And we begin to see that we believe everything we think. Really? We do. We believe everything we think. That is the definition of insanity. You know, what's I am the Jesus to Christ. And that's what Ram Dass's brother used to believe he was Christ. And Ram Dass said, yes, yes, and I'm Christ too. And Leonard would say, no, you don't understand. That's the difference. We're all Christ, not just Leonard. <laughs> but Leonard believes his thoughts. And so that's called insanity. Just a slightly deeper sense of insanity than most of us. So we have to free ourselves from all these beliefs and all these stories that we tell about, tell ourselves about ourselves all life long. We're writing the script. Like I said before, we wake up in the morning, we start writing, directing, and acting in the movie of me. All day long, me, 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 how am I now? Where am I going? Do they like me? They don't like me. What should I do? What shouldn't I do? Where should I go? What should I wear? Whatever, whatever, whatever. And then we write reviews, <laughs> which we read and get more depressed. And you just can't push a button and stop it, you see, because it's going on. It's been going on for lifetimes. This is just one chapter. So, through the repetition of the name, everything is accomplished. This is Maharaji's guarantee. It doesn't get better than that. But to get to the place where we really hear that with our whole being and can act on it. You know, one time I asked Siddhima, you know, see, Maharaj used to tease us. He would look at us and he'd say, I have the keys to the mind. I could turn your mind against me. <laughs> don't do that, don't do that. He would laugh, ah, you know. 
So I said to Siddhi Maharaj, I said, Ma, Maharaj said he has the keys to the mind. So that, to me, that means that I am where he wants me to be at every moment or where he has placed me because he has the keys to the mind. So my awareness is exactly where he wants it. So, Ma, is it all his doing? Is it all grace? Or is my effort required? This is, big, people always ask, is it all grace or, is, you know? So she said, Krishna Das, it's all grace, but you have to act like it isn't. <laughs> Beautiful. Done deal, it's finished. Nothing ever happened, nothing's ever going to happen. But do we know that? No. So that's why we have to make an effort. If you have a choice, if you think you have a choice, make it. But try to make the best choice you can for yourself. Maharaj used to tease us. He said, I'll transfer you. You know, you wake up in the morning, you know, and you go, I'm still in India? I'm going home. I, I, I miss my Cheerios. I'm going home. <laughs> and then you get on a plane and you, you know, yeah, I remember I was in India once. I met some guy, but you know, this, that's called being transferred. So one time I was at the temple in Kenchi and uh, this couple came who had not been back to India since Maharaji had left the body. It was about 30 years. And for the first time they came back. And we were uh, sitting in front of Maharaj's temple and chanting Hanuman Chalisa. And I happened to look over and I saw the woman standing on the steps just below where that, his tucket was, where his bed was, where he used to sit. And we used to sit around him and stand on those steps. And I saw her standing there and I thought, whoa, something's going on there. And then after we finished chanting, she came over to me and she said, Krishnadas, I think you're probably the only person here who could understand what I'm going to tell you. I said, what? She said, I was just standing there on the steps looking at the tucket where he used to sit. And I remembered standing in the very same place looking at him 30 years ago and I remembered thinking, I'm home. I finally made it. I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. I'll always be right here. What happened? 30 years of life went by. Jobs, children, marriage, houses, cars. But she, had, she experienced being in the right place, being finally finding home and that she would always be there. And now, after 30 years, she remembered that feeling. That's what's called transfer hogya. You got transferred. He would bring us, he would do what he had to do for us, then he'd send us back into our lives. Almost everybody. Nobody stayed with him all the time. Nobody. It was like we were on a train, you know, a train of our lives. And the train stops in a station, and we looked out the window. There's Maharaji! So we go running out, we leave the train, we're out hanging out with him, and then the next thing we know, we're back on the train. But we've been with him, and that makes all the difference. It's easy to to get caught in the, the storyline of, oh, I never met him, I never met a great saint, how can I do any of this stuff? I need to find somebody. You know, that's a nice story. You can really torture yourself with that one <laughs> very nicely. But it's not true. If it was true, then a great being like Maharaji would not be Maharaji. They're everywhere. They're in the past, the future, and the present. In fact, Hanuman is called Trikalavesham, the, the dweller in the three times, the past, present, and future. Now, always now. 
But we're stuck in the physical reality. And the physical reality is part of time. They're not in time. They're always here. We're the ones who aren't here. We're the ones who aren't here. When we get here, we'll be with them. It's very simple. So you want to see if you're here or not? Just watch your breath. If you could be with your breath for 10 seconds in 10 minutes, you're lucky. You're a saint. Just try it and notice how hard it is to just be here. The winds, and it's actually wind, it's the prana, the, 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 the channels that are full of, of knots and, and defilement that kickstart the thoughts all the time. So in order to clean those channels, one has to calm down. One has to settle. And Maharaj, you know, one time somebody came to the same, complaining to Maharaj that they didn't feel any devotion in what you do. He said, just repeat the name. Repeat it if you're angry, if you're tired, if you're, you know, this or that. If you don't, then what? And gradually, he said, go on, repeat your lying Ram Ram, your false Ram Ram. One of these days, the real Ram will come. You'll really call out. So we're practicing. We're practicing. Because they say the name and what is named, or, or God, are not different. The mantra and the deity are not different. But we don't experience that, do we? So we keep calling out, we keep repeating the, the false Ram. But one of these days it will come from our depths and the real Ram will come. Listen, when he left the body, I was destroyed. As far as I was concerned, there was no hope for me that I would never find that love again, anywhere. And for many years, I was a disaster. So if I'm telling you this, I'm talking from my own experience. I want you to, I'm not lecturing you about something that I don't know. It's possible to find that love right now, right here, because it's within us. It's actually who we are. But we think we're other things. So, as soon as we cure ourselves of thinking we're something else, we will have what we want. We'll be where we want to be. But you have to put a little time in. There's no question about it. So try to find a little, little time in your day to just be quiet. If you want to repeat a mantra, repeat a mantra. If you want to watch your breath, watch your breath. Whatever gets you off, or hopefully might get you off, do it. But do something. If you don't, if you don't plant seeds, nothing will grow. It's very simple. Every moment we're planting seeds. Every action, every thought is a karmic seed that we're planting. And they will all bring fruit. If we plant seeds of anger and shame and fear and greed and general nastiness, that's what we get. If we begin to try to plant seeds of kindness and compassion and caring, and try to let go of the, all the self-hatred and the self-loathing we have, and then those seeds will also bring fruit. So, try to take some time to calm your ass down.
All right, any questions or anything like that? Do we have a microphone? Are we doing that? Did we prepare for that or am I supposed to keep yapping for the whole time? We have a mic. So if you have something you want to say, raise your hand and somebody will beat you up. I remember one time Ramdas was had smoked a lot of dope and he was really paranoid and he didn't want to go out there and talk. He said, I don't know what to talk about, I don't know what to say. And I said, look, it's really easy. Just go out and say, we will sit in silence until someone has something to say. So he went out there and he said, we will sit in silence until something has someone to say. <laughs> Everybody in the room, I went out there. And he didn't have to have a program, he was liberated. Nobody. Okay. Acha. Hello? Wait, where are you? Okay. Hi. Um, so, my question is, if I was wondering if you could speak on the belief that uh, God would be found outside of oneself. Um, speak what? Um, that, if, that God would be found outside of oneself. Um, that if... You know, we were to go to the mountains or to India or find some high-souled saint and that then he, she would reveal herself. And how does one cultivate the patience and devotion to seek that love within oneself? If you go to the mountains, where will you be? Everywhere you go, that's where you are, and that's where you'll find God. There's no, there is no outside. It just looks that way. We, we think there's an outside, so it looks like way, but everything, we're all in our own particular little movie here. We share a certain bandwidth so we can talk to each other and beat each other up and all that stuff. But we're all, we each have our own version of what's going on, and inside of that, you'll find yourself. There's no, with this word God is a very difficult word, you know. In India, they have millions of names for God. Yeah, same being, but different way of looking at it. Poor Western religion just has one little deity, you know, gets very upset. <laughs> but, uh, just, you have to start where you are, you know, you have, to, you have to look at yourself, you have to try to be kind to yourself. And if you can't, you have to figure out why you can't. What are your motives? What's pushing you to be hard on yourself? Why do, why do we, why are we so hard on ourselves? Well, in my case, my parents were very hard on themselves. So I kind of absorbed the way they looked at themselves as the way I look at myself. Not how, so much how they looked at me or how they saw me, but more how they saw themselves growing up in that atmosphere. You know, so, I mean, there's just so many ways of going into the, the issues. But ultimately, we get the strength to let go of those issues from practice. It's one thing to be aware, and it's a good thing to be aware of what's pushing us around, but it's still not easy to release those energies. So it's through practice, which is simply, once again, again and again and again, letting go, training ourselves to remember, to let go, to remember, to let go, again and again. That's how we develop that inner core, that inner strength. But you don't get the, you know, the real progress is kind of under the radar. You don't really get to see it. Over time, though, you can notice that you spend less time in negative states of mind. You spend less time beating yourself up. You might go days without giving yourself a hard time. Like for me, I was born a moper. I, my whole life, I moped around. 
You know, it's like my default position. I hardly mope anymore. It's, I miss it. <laughs> it was home base for so long. I now, you know, it's like, so every once in a while I'll do it just for fun. It's good. It feels so good. You know. It doesn't last, but it's okay. So, it's not like there's not reasons why we see ourselves a certain way. And it's good to be more aware of what's going on in there. But at the same time, it's only from some kind of practice that you develop the ability to let go. The training. You have to train yourself to remember again and again to let go, let go, let go and come home again and again and again. You don't have to figure it all out. It figures itself out over time. But you do have to pay attention. And if we spend a little bit more time, put a little bit more energy into meeting each other being, and, and treating them the way we would like to be treated, it would really change a lot for us. It really would change our kind of, the way we go through our day. Because right now we're very busy projecting something for everybody. You know, we, you know, we want to be seen a certain way, so I've got our hair a certain way, we've got to wear certain clothes, put on certain makeup, color ourselves, this or that. We're very aware and, and constantly trying to find a position with other people. But if we consciously try to meet people right there where they are, when you say, hi, hello, it cuts through all that stuff. And it, little by little, it will release us from needing to be seen a certain way by other people. It's very important for us. It's a big part of our lives, trying to be seen a certain way. Nobody likes to be treated like shit. But so we spend a lot of time covering that shit up, <laughs> trying to make it look good so people will like our shit. It takes a lot of work. After a while, when you don't have to do that so much, oh my goodness, it's like a fucking vacation. Sorry. <laughs> you can take New York out of the boy, or the boy out of New York, but you can't take the Cheerios out of somebody who's been eating them their whole lives. Yeah. Where's the mic? There's only one mic for 6,042 people. Okay. Uh, raise your hand, yeah. Josie, you keep the hand down. Because. Because you have a doggy, that's why. Hi. Uh, hi. So my question is, you keep talking about letting, letting it go, but when One is... One second. Can you turn her up, please? Oh, what do I do? Can you turn her up in here, in my, my monitor? I got it. Oh, I have to be louder. Okay, that's a little better. Go ahead. Yeah, I have to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> They turned it up, you turned yourself down. Okay, good. That's, that's my problem with the world. They say you have to talk louder and then you have to talk <laughs> not louder. But how though? Is it good? Okay, yeah, very good. 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 <laughs> so my question, I forgot. Good. It's even better. <laughs> you know, this... This is what I'm dealing with life every day. Like my boss says, uh, you're sounding alive, but suddenly you're not alive. You have to be more alive. And then I forget what I have to do. That's okay. <laughs> this is exactly that what's just happening. proves you're really alive, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me think of my question again. Okay, we'll wait. <laughs> Breathe in. We can come oh, back to you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, so, yeah, the question was, 
about letting go, but it's a lot of work every day for years and years and years of trying to let it go. Mm-hmm. And then for five seconds, you're able to let it go. And then the whole world dawns on you. And then you have to, they're making you feel that this is so real, you can't let it go. And it's a struggle, struggle yeah. to live this life. And I don't know what my question is. Mm. But. When is this going to be over? <laughs> the struggle is worth it. Bullshit. <laughs> um, you know, there's a, the fire sermon is a beautiful teaching by Buddha. He says, he says, Here was my thought. I thought, okay, I heard what you said, but you know if you put your hand in fire, you're not going to think about having to take it out. (sighs) Right? Even if you get close to the fire, you're going to pull back. Correct? So we don't realize, we are not aware. Our, Our awareness is so gross that we are taking pleasure we don't understand that it's actually suffering. So one of the first ser- sermons of the Buddha was called the fire sermon. He said, the eyes are on fire with seeing. The ears are on fire with hearing. The skin is on fire with touch, etc., etc." So when you're hungry, you'll look for food. If you're happy in life, fine. Chill out. You don't have to do anything. Who says you have to meditate? No, you don't have to do anything. But when you you feel the need, then you will put the time in. And because when you become aware of of, that your hand is already in the fire, you're going to get it out of there as fast as possible. So you don't have to be hard on yourself, and you know, know, there's no reason to beat yourself up for no reason. And yes, the spiritual, for, for most of us, it appears that the spiritual path takes a long time and a lot of con- commitment and a lot of work. But what are the options? What are you going to do? I mean, you can watch everything on television and still be suffering when it's over. So eventually, you start to long not to be gone. It's like, I love to binge watch, you know, like, a, like three or four years of one particular show, you know? I'll just start and you won't see me for a week, you know? <laughs> but what, did I really want to be gone for a week like that? I can't do that anymore. I just can't do it. I used to do it. I just can't anymore. I mean, the idea of being gone for a week scares me even. And we're gone most of the time. Think about your days. You wake up. What do you do between you wake up and you go to sleep? Are you even here for one millisecond in a whole day? We're just bouncing off shit all day long. All life long. Whoa. And so, but on the other hand, we're all here, right? This didn't happen by mistake. We had to plan to get here. We had to want to come here. We had to make the money to come here. We had to do a lot of things, make a lot of arrangements to come here. That's incredible. Because very few, percentage-wise, it's a very small percentage of beings on the planet who give a shit about this stuff at all, who are even aware that anything else is possible. So how wonderful is that? Even if you hear and you say, ah, oh, this was bullshit, this was a mistake, I can't, I, what the fuck did I come here for? These people are out of their minds. <laughs> I saw that guy in the back thinking that, you know. But you're still here, and your own karma has brought you here because there's a part of every one of us that longs to be free, that longs for that love that doesn't come and go. 
We want that. But unfortunately, there's no button to push to make it come. It's not like one of those soda machines, you know. Boop, two Pepsis. So if we want that, the more we recognize that longing. You know, longing is a really interesting feeling. On one hand, it totally ruins our lives. Nothing is enough. No relationship is going to make it. No amount of apple pie is going to save me. But on the other hand, the longing saves us. Because we can never be at ease as long as we know we don't have what we really want. The question is, most of us don't know that we can't have that. But if you're here, come on, we, you know, to some degree, there was no reason to come. I mean, aside from the mating and dating. <laughs> so, we have to give ourselves some credit for this. Okay. Give her the mic. Thanks. Um, I have a question about um, just some guidance on trying to find God and trying to find love in the times that we're in the most physical or earthly suffering. And um, the reason why I'm asking is because I'm kind of seeing my father go through this spiritual crisis at the moment, and he's been a lifelong meditator and chanted his whole life, and he's been the most spiritually in tune person I was, who was close to me, and now he has Parkinson's disease and over the past few years has had a, a great deal of health challenges, and so as he's felt his physical limitations yeah. become harder, he's you know, expressed, I'm ready to die and things like that, but that's probably not going to happen anytime soon, and so he's switched to this phase of feeling like God's punishment, punishing me. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so sad because he's, he's always felt this you know, intense, deep love from God, and now he's, he's lost that. Yeah. It's easy to blame God because she can't defend herself. My father died from Alzheimer's, complications from Alzheimer's. And um, as he was disintegrating, there was one point where he, he, when he remembered, he knew what was happening. Like we were in a taxi together and we'd been talking about, we'll get together you know, tomorrow, I'll meet you at that restaurant at six. So as he was getting out of the cab, I said, okay, Dad, so I'll see you over there, all right? And he went like, you know, his eyes, he realized he had no memory of what we were talking about. So there's this period where they go through this panic, but that'll pass. And then they relax a little bit. They lost it enough so that they're no longer in that middle place for a long time he would be sitting there. He said, I want to go home. He would be sitting in his apartment where he'd lived for 50 years. And in his mind he was thinking about the house he grew up in Brooklyn. I want to go home. I want to go home. You know, Dad, you're home. And he, he, you know. But it's a phase. The good part is we're the ones who suffer. They don't feel anything. My, dad, my father, we walk in, he had a big bruise on his head. Dad, what happened? What do you mean? He didn't even feel physical pain. So that it'll get easier for him. He'll, 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 he will go gently into that night, you know, because he won't remember. And so I was happy to be, you know, be the one who was, who was there, you know. And, um, It's just your dad's way of talking and thinking about things. It's, God's not, there's no God to punish anybody, you know, it's not like that. But 
that's the way his anxiety is expressing itself. You just be there with him and love him and, you know, just, you know. <laughs> my father could remember one thing. Whenever my mother's, they were divorced for like 50 years. Whenever my mother's name came up, her name was Sylvia, my father would be like, he go, Sylvia? <laughs> you go, she was a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's the only thing he could remember <laughs> in a whole life. So. <laughs> I used to go see him. He lived in the city and I, I live in the state, so Every time I was going to go off on a tour, I'd go spend some time with him because I, would, I didn't know, you know, if I came back, when I came back, if he'd remember me. So I'd go and hang out with him and we watched the same reruns of Jerry Seinfeld again and again and again and again. And one day I'm sitting on the couch and he's sitting in his chair watching, you know, staring at the TV. And he goes... And he gets up, and he comes over to the couch, and he sits next to me, and he looks at me and he says, what you're doing is so great, I'm so proud of you. Traveling around the world, singing with people, it's so wonderful. It went on like for maybe 30 seconds, even though it felt like three weeks, you know, it's like, <laughs> he's right there, you know, and I'm like, you know, it's so wonderful, you're doing this, and then he just disappeared again, went back to the chair, back to Seinfeld. That was the last time I saw him, the last time he was, although one time he was in a, in a home the last couple of years, and my sister went to visit him and she played a video of, of one of the kirtans. And my father turned to my sister and said, tell KD I'm singing with him in my mind. <laughs> so, but you know, it's going to happen. It's inevitable what's going on. Don't just let it, let it happen. I mean, there's nothing you can do about stopping it at this point. And the good part, like I said, is that he's, he'll reach a place where he's not suffering anymore. That anxiety will he'll go through that spot. And then he'll, uh, it usually happens anyway. My father was a piece of work. So I got off the plane from India, two and a half years in India, two and a half years being celibate in India. I get off the plane, I go to my mother's house for one night, and I go to the A&P and get Cheerios. <laughs> and I go to the city the next night, and I spend my... We, he takes me to a Nick game, a basketball game, and as we're walking down the street after the game, we pass a movie theater, and it said, The Devil and Miss Jones. And I said, The Devil and Miss Jones? What's that? He said, Let's go in. It was a porn movie. So within 24 hours, I had a bowl of Cheerios, a Nick game, and a porn movie. <laughs> kind of set the stage for the next 30 or 40 years, you know. <laughs> Jesus. The Devil and Miss Jones is an interesting picture, by the way. <laughs> if you want to want to see a movie about the uh, the futility of uh, sexual pleasure. That'll teach you a lot. <laughs> you know, we've all been sold this bill of goods, you know, that if we could only find the right situation, the right house, or the right job, or the right relationship, or the right lover, or the right car, we'll be happy forever. Bullshit. It's just not that way. But we, it's in there. It's a program that's running. And, if we can, you know, and it keeps running. 
And it, it affects everything we do, every relationship, every experience. We, we keep measuring everything. Is it enough? Is it not enough? What if it's this? What if I do that? Will it be enough? Hey, it's never going to be enough until it's enough inside. Then everything's enough. That's the joke. And that's the truth. Anybody? You pick, JR, you pick. Give him some rupees, he'll pick you. You can just pass it. You don't have to run over people. Thank you. Um, it seems to me like uh, people like you and Ram Dass and like Raghu, who spent time with Maharaji, have cultivated this kind of presence that can facilitate the awakenings of others. Um, have, have what? what, have what? Can uh, facilitate the awakening of others. Like the first time I heard Ram Dass's voice, something happened and I just kind of woke up. Uh, and I've found that like, when I share my practice and, and the teachings that I've learned, that some other people will have, they'll tell me something clicked in their head. Uh, and I was wondering if you could just comment on that thing that passes through us from, from one being to another, the love, the presence, the awareness, whatever it is. Well, from my point of view, uh, it, it's Maharaji transmitting. That's what it is. Uh, he, he could use a stone, a rock, could transmit if he wanted it to, but he happens to, whatever, karmically, a couple of people, a few people show up. But we're always sharing our, you know, we're not aware of, of the whole spectrum of vibration, but we're always, everybody we meet, everybody we see, everybody we're in touch with, we're, we're trans, transmitting ourself in one level or another, so. Um, If you take it personally, you're going to be in trouble, that's for sure. So, but on the other hand, you, one should recognize what's happening also. But uh, don't get any... Uh, there's a beautiful bhajan about Hanuman, where after the war is over, and Ram and Sita and Lakshman, they all come back to Ayodhya, and they meet their other brothers, Bharat and Satrugan. And Bharat looks around, he sees the monkey, he sees Hanuman. And he says, who's that? Who's that monkey? And Ram says, oh brother, we can never repay the debt we owe to this monkey. And every verse is talking about the things that Hanuman did. And one verse said, he jumped over the ocean, he killed the demons, he did this and this, and not once did pride arise in his mind. Not once did he, he identify with being the doer. You know. It's a beautiful bhajan. And at the end, Tulsidas, and every, every verse is just so sweet, and then at the end, Tulsidas, who wrote the bhajan, he says, I'm telling you, the, I'm telling you these words of praise of Hanuman, in the very words that came from the Lord's mouth. Whoa. It's really powerful. So, one time um, Maharaji w went up to the top of this hill in Chitrakut called Hanumandhara. And when he got there, he sat down in this place uh, called Sita Rasoi, Sita's Kitchen, which is a place where Ram and Sita and Lakshman lived. And there's a spring there that comes up out of the mountain. And Maharaji sat down by the spring and he said to Dara, he said, Dara, after burning Lanka, Hanumanji came here to calm down, to cool off. But then Dara told me, he said, then Maharaji said very quietly, under his breath, kind of, 
But Hanuman was always at peace. So no matter what he was doing, he was always at peace. He never identified with the, the, the action or being the doer of an action. There was no delusion of separate self there. He knew Ram was the doer. Everywhere he went, he saw, you know, we see like, how many colors do we see? Red, yellow, red orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo, violet. Six? I can't even count. Red, orange, yellow, blue, green, indigo. Seven. The eighth color is the color of Ram, which we don't see with the eyes, but the heart sees that color. And Hanuman saw that color everywhere, and he knew everything was happening inside of the space of Ram. We're like little ants scurrying around down here, you know? We have to open up. Look at that boy run. <laughs> Not once did he identify with being the runner. <laughs> uh, thank you for, for giving us your time here. Uh, you were saying how devastated you were when your guru left his body. Was there one moment when you felt him again and you knew that maybe he hadn't abandoned you and then if that happened do you now always feel his presence? Do you have to access it? Does he come and go? <clears throat> well I was saved by Maharaji I could not save myself. I didn't have the tools. I didn't have even the inclination. I was too fucked up. I could not do, I couldn't. So, one time I went to India and um, and I was so depressed. All I wanted to do was go into my room and hide. Unfortunately, it was Durga Puja time, this 10-day period where they do fire ceremony every day and worshiping the goddess. And I say unfortunately because even though all I wanted to do was go to my room and sleep for a week and hide, they went, oh, Krishna Das has come. He was the pujari at the Devi temple. Now he's come, we'll come and do the puja with us. <laughs> but you can't say no. So all day long I had to sit by this humongous fire and throw shit into it, you know. I was going, swaha, swaha, god damn it. It was so horrible, I can't tell you. And then I hadn't sat on the floor for like a year, you know. And there I was on the floor with ashes and dust and grease and shit all over me. And then you couldn't eat all day. There was a puja in the morning, then a break, and then a puja in the afternoon, and then nighttime you could eat. So after the morning puja, everybody would come up to the front of the temple to, to the tucket, and we'd do arti. We'd sing Jaya Jagadish Hare and offer of the lights, and then everybody would bow and then go rest for a couple of hours. So, I was standing like, on, like this on the side. Everybody was doing, you know. So everybody bowed down. And then everybody got up. One old lady had bowed down to the tucket, you know, the bed, put her head on the bed. And she went into samadhi. She didn't get up. She went, she just went into trance and she was gone. And she's just like that. And I saw this, and it was like a spear through the center of my heart. And I thought, 
He's real for these people. He's real for these people. He's present for these people. It was like getting hit by a truck. And I kind of staggered over to the temp the Davy Temple was right there, and I just sat down like this, you know. And it was brutal. Well, Sidney Ma had seen me out of the side window, and she sent somebody to get me. And this woman comes around and she says, Kitty, Sidney Ma calling. And I thought, why don't they just leave me the fuck alone and let me die? <laughs> but you can't say no, so I got up. I walked in the kind of the back door there and through the little courtyard where Maharaji would sit. And Ma was sitting in Maharaji's room, sitting on the floor at the, at the foot of the bed. And I walked in the room, and I got hit with a thunderbolt in the center of my chest. And I fell on the ground, and I was crying, weeping. I, I, I never cried like that, and I, I couldn't stop and I was just bawling. And I kept thinking, oh my God, she's gonna think out of my, I'm out of my mind, I gotta stop, but I couldn't stop. And at the moment that that lightning bolt hit me, a few things happened in that instant. The first thing was, I remembered every second of every moment of every day of my life, from the moment I heard he died, until that moment, like the frames of a movie, you know, <laughs> like that. In, in, a, you know, in an instant, I saw my whole life, every minute of my life, and I saw everything I had done. I saw why I had done it. I saw everything, why I've been hurting myself, why I wanted to die, and all this stuff. And I saw that I had built a wall around my heart and I would not let myself feel him. I was angry, I was hurt, and I, I, he had left me, and I had left him, and I, I, wouldn't, and I wouldn't let myself feel him. And I saw every brick on the wall had like a neon sign. Shame, shame, fear, fear, anger, anger, guilt, all these neon signs going up. Like, and then I saw he was the wall was nothing to him. He was over the wall, on the wall, in the wall, and that he'd been with me every second of every day of my life. And then I saw that I could take that wall down. All I had to do was look at it. I could not pretend that it wasn't there. I had to look at the stuff, and the stuff would go away and I'm still crying. And then there's a bang on the window, and someone's saying, Krishna Das, we are waiting for puja. <laughs> Two hours went by? What, what? So I dragged my sorry ass over to the puja, and I'm sitting next to Indra Babu, who is our devotee, and he was sponsoring the puja. And I'm going, ah, and I'm weeping, I'm weeping. And he kept looking over me. <laughs> because, you know, Indians aren't big huggers, you know. It's just namaste this and namaste that, you know. So he looks at me, he says, Krishna Rajti, has someone died? <laughs> so he kind of... I couldn't stop crying, it was days. And one day I was walking across the courtyard and Mrs. Sony, who was like, unbelievable devotee of Maharaji, she came, she saw me and she comes up and she says, Krishna Das, are you all right? And all I could go, Ma, Maharaji. And, I'm, and she goes, exactly. And her eyes went up in her head. <laughs> And then they came down and she kind of floated away. <laughs> I thought, these people are not human. <laughs> so I have to say, I was, I was in ecstasy. I have taken every drug known to man. 
And let me tell you, it doesn't fucking come close to this. I could barely, uh, yeah, I can eat, you know, this is that. I was like floating around, it was so great. And I thought, and every once in a while, the bliss would kind of come down a little bit like this. And I saw, if I just took a little breath, like, ah, he came back. How compassionate and kind is the Lord. Not only does he give the bliss, but he gives the way to keep the bliss. I was just floating. So a couple of days went by like that. Then one morning, I woke up. I, like, picture in your mind an old house that burnt down, and then it got rained on, and then the dogs came in and pissed all over the place. That's me. And I'm going, <laughs> nothing was happening. <laughs> I couldn't die. Like, <laughs> I completely flipped out. I went up to the roof of the Dharmsala, which was flat at that time. It was about 100 yards long. And it's nestled in this valley with this... LSD blue sky and the mountains and and I'm storming back and forth on this roof and I'm screaming at Maharaji at the top of my lungs you leave me alone if you're gonna close me down don't open me up just leave me the fuck alone and I'm screaming and I can see the ladies in the field picking potatoes going like <laughs> you know and I'm just strangling <laughs> like this, you know, I was completely insane. So then, that same woman who came to get me the first time, she comes up on the roof and she goes, Kitty, sit in my corner, and she ran away, you know. <laughs> so I said, good, because I'm going back to the States, and I'm going to tell her that. And I, boom, boom, walked down, and she had come up from the Part, first part of the temple up to the, the Tawari's room and they were sitting in the room and I came up boom, boom and I stood at the door like this and she looked at me and she said something and everybody giggled <laughs> what did she say? <laughs> and then they told me Sidney Ma said I was like a little boy who'd been given a sweet a candy and eaten it up in one bite and wanted another one. <laughs> but I couldn't have another one right away. But don't worry, I'll have another one someday. <laughs> mm, okay. I'm going to go to my room, okay? I'm going to go lay down in my room, okay? Okay. I fell into my room, I fell down in bed, I slept for about a day, and when I woke up, I was me again. <laughs> but that, that was, uh, I know what born again means, because that was the day that they kind of said, all right, let's let the kid live, you know, <laughs> boom. And that was it. And then I came back, got into therapy, marriage counseling. Oh boy. But that was, it was, it was, it, it was really the beginning of the rest of my life. So when people say, you know, how, I don't know how, why, but they, they saved me, you know. And um, I just didn't have the tools to make it. I don't know how to explain it. I just didn't have the tools. I, I, I wasn't going to make it. And um, for whatever reason, they wanted me around, so I'm here. That's the long answer to a short question. <laughs> I 
Shiddhi Ma used to tease me. She said, here's the other, yeah, oh, well, that's a whole other story. There's no time for that now. But she used to tease me. No, 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 never mind. <laughs> you don't want to hear that. <laughs> but anyway, really, that was, uh, that was grace. That was severe grace. And uh, it, it, I, I just wouldn't have made it. I don't know how to, you know, I, I wouldn't be here. But it was for some reason I, that they, they, they saved me. They saved me for this. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you know, grace is, the word grace is, very, by definition, no one deserves grace. Grace is grace. You don't deserve grace. Nobody earns grace. Grace is always there. Grace is our natural state, but we, we close ourselves off to it. Grace is our, our true nature, the state of grace, being in harmony with the universe. It's who we are. But we don't think those thoughts. We don't think that's who we are, so we fill it in with other definitions. So when we chant, remember, it's the sound of the name. We're hearing it with our ears. We're making that sound with our voices. But at the same time, our minds, our awareness is meeting that form, that shape, that sound. And over time, they melt together, that melts. Because these names are the names of our own true nature. So we don't have to manufacture anything when we chant. We don't have to try to feel, you don't have to be jump, you can jump up and down if you like, but you don't have to. You just, we just keep bowing to the sound by paying attention, by being, by listening. And you'll see, you can't. You've got a billion thoughts every minute, even while you're singing. Okay, as soon as you notice, just come back. That's all. Every time you come back, it's a fucking miracle. Why do we ever come back? Really, think about it. Why do we ever come back? Because we ourselves have planted the seeds of coming back before this moment. Otherwise, you wouldn't come back. There's a lot of people in this world who, f for whatever reason, don't have the opportunity or the awareness to do these, to know what's possible. And so they spend their whole lives asleep, essentially. And what, what else could we feel but compassion and caring for beings who are suffering? And for ourselves.
dinner time. <laughs> Good night.